Sambuddhasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sankang Namasami Ito Parang Sakajang Dhammo So Dabodi Okay, very good. Welcome everybody again. Again, as I said, this is my last day and I, I feel pretty, pretty good. It feels like, like the place has been decked out for me for my last day. It's celebratory, there's lights everywhere just for anybody that's at home. There's balloons and all this kind of stuff. So I feel like I'm getting like sent off with a party kind of thing. This is great. It's really, it's really, really good. So I'd just like to reiterate that, yeah, that, uh, today is my uh, last day here that I'll be giving the talk today. I le actually leave on Monday, but today's the last day I'll probably see you all. And just wanted to reflect how, how fortunate I am and how grateful I am to actually have come here and to see what's happening here. Um, there's been a lot of very, very positive things on my trip, and I think the biggest thing that has been so positive is actually so seeing the community that's growing here seeing the people that are so, uh, so intent on actually practicing the Dhamma and helping, helping the Sangha and you know, coming and offering food to the monks every morning in, in Pike Place. Um, and the, not only the, the in-person Seattle community, but also all the people that are, that are online as well that are uh, contributing in those kinds of ways. There's a very, very vibrant community here. And so um, I... I, I came here with this idea in my mind of like, oh, let's let's sort of see. There's you know, uh, many many monks want to start a monastery. And it's like, oh, well, why why are you doing that? And so I thought I'd come here and see Nisabo. And it's like, well, why are you doing it? And I can actually see that it's it's actually useful here. There's a lot of people that are really willing to practice, um, and there's a lot of interest here, and there's a lot of there's a uh, harmonious kind of community here. So. I think it's you know it's a it's a definitely a, a worthwhile thing, and I'm very very grateful to actually be a small part of it. And you all are you all are a part of it, so that's a really nice thing. I've also you know had some you know also just besides the Dhamma, I've also had some really fun things happen while I'm here. It's been great. You know, I told you last week I saw an orca, which was cool. Um, I you know and I've been to some around to some like great places, and I'm really uh, grateful for all the people that have taken. American history and art and the museums. Um, uh, went to this Seattle Asian Museum, which was cool. You have like one of the best collection of of views that I've seen anywhere. So that's that's really great. Um, went to so many other. Think of off the top of my head, and uh, in actuality, like one of the one of the most fun things that I have to that I have to admit to is like my. 12 year old self was absolutely stoked and excited I got to go and see some like grunge places so I my angsty teenage youth would have been so happy to have seen these places and I saw some of them like ah, that's great so that's really good so I'm really really grateful and also grateful for I um, have to give a special um, uh, uh, thank you to, to Dave and Allison as well who put the monastics up here this is uh, they, they really just they, they give you a place to live and don't expect anything for it. So I'm really, really grateful to Dave and Allison. Um, and so, yeah, I've had some really you know, fantastic things and met a lot of good people. Um, but there's also, there's also been some aspects of, of coming here as well It's like that were quite shocking as well. Um, I think I've told the first day I got here, I arrived at night. And I arrived, Steve picked me up and it was dark and, you know, drove me from the airport, drove me to the ferry, went on the ferry, everything's dark, I'm not seeing anything that's happening. And, you know, Nisabo take me back and we stayed the night, it's like, okay, we get up and we go arms around early in the morning, go arms around early in the morning, it's dark, it's dark as, I don't know what's going on. Nisabo is taking me on arms around, he's like, okay, we have to go and get the mail. I'm like, uh, okay, okay, he's like, but we're gonna I'm gonna take you to a place that's called the Razor. The Razor? That sounds, that sounds insane. 
and it's you know, up near the post office, like a lot of the places are boarded up and there's a lot of homeless people and there's a lot of Uh, obviously uh, suffering in uh, many ways and you sort of drive around in the daytime and you see a lot of people living in tents and all these kinds of things so there's some also some very kind of shocking things that I've seen while I've been here as well and it's like it's really 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 surprising and so you know what do we, what do we do with something like this um, it for, for me this this brings up the reflection about samsara and what samsara actually is. You know, the common, common kind of view of what samsara is, the vicissitudes of life, of think good things and bad things happening. And that uh, when, we, when we look around here, there's so many good things that I've experienced, so many good people, so many, and, and another good thing was like American people, I really thought you were gonna be like really arrogant and really rude and all these kinds of things, but you've been really nice. Really nice and really polite, and people, hello, how are you? It's like, hey, how are you? It's been great. And I also had some people, you know, I've been a monk for a long time. I had anybody abuse me, but I get, I get a bit of abuse nearly every day here on, on Arms Round. Just somebody that walks, random person that walks past is like, oh, Gandhi, what are you doing here? <laughs> so <it's, laughs> you obviously, you don't take it seriously. It's, it's um, yeah, again, people that are, that are sort of uh, struggling in some kind of way, so it's not a, not a big deal. So again, it really brings up this recollection or reflection on samsara, the vicissitudes of life. Um, one thing you get when you go to India, uh, and a lot of people say this and reflect on this, that you know, there's a reason the Buddha arose in India. It's because in India you can see the suffering that's around you in, in a very real and obvious manner. Um, but also you can see a lot of, the, uh, a lot of the, the comforts there as well. So you can really see the, the human experience in somewhere like India. Um, and so I actually think, you're, in a way, you're sort of fortunate in Seattle that you actually can see some of the, some, the human experience for what it actually is. So just for anyone that doesn't really know what actually is samsara, maybe, maybe, you're not, uh, maybe you're not familiar with that term. So many people uh, have this idea of what samsara is. It is just the kind of the good, the bad in life, the vicissitude of life. Um, but it is a very, you could say it's a very important part of the, of the Buddha's teachings. Um, there, there is this idea there that, um, that it is the, they call it the continual cycle of birth and death. Um, anybody that's maybe seen these like great, uh, what are they called? Bawajaka, Bawajaka artworks in Tibetan artworks uh, with that kind of wheel, that wheel of life kind of thing. Essentially, that's what is a, it's a visual representation of, of what we call samsara, the, the wheel of uh, birth and death. Um, it's not necessarily a Buddhist idea. It's not necessarily a Buddhist conceptualization. It was around before Buddhism. Uh, it was about 800 BC or something like that. Uh, I think it was in the Upanishads where it first came about. But what, uh, what uh, uh, systems like Buddhism and Jainism did, they did something a little bit different with samsara, is that uh, beforehand within the, in the Upanishads, samsara concept whereby uh, you're, you're born and you die and you just keep getting born and dying and you're not, that's nothing, you're just sort of born and die in the same kind of state. Buddhism introduced this aspect that you're where you are born and you die, it's, it's got something to do with your karma. It's got something to do with your actions and your, uh, the kind of causes and the results that you're putting in the be uh, born and die in different places. So Buddhism and Jainism really introduced this aspect of karma as well. Karma that you can change your karma, that you can do good things and uh, good things will come out of it, bad things, bad things will come out of it. The idea behind samsara as well is that it, it's a perpetual cycle. Uh, the Buddha said that it has no beginning and it'll have no end. So there's something really interesting in that, in that like, samsara is permanent. We think that actually samsara is actually something that's permanent. So everyone says, you know, Buddhism is all about impermanence. This is one thing we think is permanent as well. Now, 
way we say that it's not permanent is that there is a way out of it. And if we uh, 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 realize the Four Noble Truths, we realize Nibbana, we realize Nirvana, enlightenment, then we'll be freed from the cycle of birth and death. We'll be free from samsara. So, and another interesting thing is uh, Nibbana as well. This is also seen as something that's permanent. So samsara is permanent, this cycle of birth and death and vicissitudes of life, but also Nibbana, the highest happiness, these things are permanent. So we'll come back, I'll, we'll come back to this in a minute, that these two things are permanent. So just the, to signpost is like, if these two things are permanent, they have to coexist in some way. They have to be together in some kind of way. Get out of samsara. Why do we need to escape from it? Well, the Buddhist conceptualization says something along the lines samsara is dukkha, or that samsara is uh, it's, you know, unsatisfactory. Samsara is something that um, causes some discontent. There is discontent within samsara. Even though things might be good, there is some kind of discontent within that. And so we have the idea that because there is discontent, what we should do is aim for Nibbana, aim for the highest, aim for enlightenment. Because um, Nibbana is something that is a higher happiness than the worldly happiness. Now, yeah, do we really know that you know, we say that Nibbana is the highest happiness and that samsara is something that's there, but like, do we actually truly know that? You know, we do have to take it on a little bit of faith. You know, we do have to take it as a kind of working hypothesis because, look, we're not, we're not enlightened. We're not enlightened, so we don't actually really know this yet. And so, you know, what do we, what do, we do with this? Well, you know, if, if that's the case, if we don't really know, well, what do we do? We can sort of see other aspects of the Buddhist teaching uh, are quite useful for us, quite useful for us in our practice. And so it's like, well, this is, this is something useful. This is something I can actually use. But again, you know, I don't sort of really actually know. So w what's the big problem with being in samsara then? What's, you know, what's, what's the big deal? Like you, you ask many people on the street and most people will say to you, it's like, yeah, what's wrong with life? Life's pretty awesome. Like there's so many things like love, there's so many things like connection, there's so many things like family, there's so many things like, like new experience, uh, 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 aesthetics and the beauty of nature, all these things that make life worthwhile. It's like, well, that's, that's not dukkha. That's not suffering. That's not suffering in any kind of way. What's wrong with that? Like, what's, you know, if, okay, samsara, okay, there's some bad in it, but there's also this really, really good thing as well. I'll take, you know, I'll, I'll take that deal. I'll take that deal. If there's a bit, little bit of suffering in that, that's fine. I'll, I'll take the love and all these kinds of things. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, that's what it's like now. But what's it going to be like tomorrow? We might have love, we might have connection, things might be going really, really well, but what happens tomorrow? Can we actually really know? Do we ever know exactly what our life is going to be like? You know, the person you are now, how much control of that did you have yourself? Yeah, I know myself, it's like, I don't know how I ended up in this, this kind of situation that I'm in right now. It's just a few different things I, I took, I had made some sort of choices and it led me in a particular kind of way. I'm also very lucky, I'm healthy, all these kinds of things. It's just this massive kind of karmic roll of the dice that I'm the person that I am now. But everything could change tomorrow. Everything could change. Everything could be taken away. We, you know, we look at different aspects of our lives and we can sort of see it's like you don't know exactly what's going to happen. So this is sort of one of the reasons why we would say, we would say it's like, well, well maybe, you know, you know, 
maybe something like samsara, maybe we're not totally sure about what samsara actually is. Maybe we're not entirely sure about what Nibbana actually is. But what we do know is that in some way, if I practice these teachings, there is some benefit to it there. There is something useful there. You know, so we can, we can sort of put these kinds of things aside of like, well, you know, is there a perpetual cycle of birth and death and all these kinds of things? These, uh, you know, are beings born and our beings die? This can, for some people, this can be uh, concerning or they don't quite get it. It's, it's fine. And you can just sort of put those things aside. The problem we do have, though, is that we have this perpetually unstable existence right now. That's what we have. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. You don't know what this afternoon is going to bring. So what do you do with that? It, you know, you can either sort of like ignore it and keep going on with your life. But again, if we think about what is very, very useful in our practice is that it, it can improve some parts of our existence. Our practice improves something. Our practice can make something better in our lives. So there's this aspect of the practice where we can do something to make our existence a little bit better. We can do something to make our existence a little bit more positive. And when we do the practice, it improves something about your own life. And that has a knock-on effect to other people's lives. For myself, it's like I, I had no idea at all that me ordaining as a Buddhist monk would have any kind of positive effect. Just no idea. I was, I was selfish when I was thinking about it. It's like I'm just doing it for myself. But through the course of me being a, uh, a Buddhist monk, I've been able to you know, talk to people and, and help people with different things. So there's a positive outcome that comes through that. So even within within something like samsara, we can make a difference. We can make the world a little bit better of a place. There's something we can do that actually makes the world a little bit better. And so it's not like that we think we're in samsara, so it's like throw your hands up and don't do anything and you know, I, I just have to give up. This thing is perpetually, perpetually going to sort of drag me around. We can do something and we can make something better. And we can do this by through our own actions. We can do this through uh, seeing when something's wrong and trying to improve that in some way. Taking some kind of responsibility on seeing when something's useful in the world and actually doing that. This is, this is really actually using our karma well, using our intentions and our actions well to move through this. So. The reason I think this is so important is that it sort of gets back to exactly what I started talking about, is that I've come to Seattle, I've seen a lot of good things, there's been a lot of really, really beautiful and beneficial things, but there's also some bad things. And so, and if I remember what I said about Nibbana and Samsara both being permanent, the thing is, have to, we have to think about with this is that these things coexist. Things that are good and things that are bad coexist together. They exist in the same place. All the good in Seattle is in Seattle. All the bad that's in Seattle is in Seattle. All the good and the bad that's within your own heart, it's in the same place. You know, the Dhamma and the world are actually in the same place. Any kind of pleasure, any kind of pain, it all is in the same place. It's all in this place that we inhabit. And it's all in, within our existence. One of the Dhamma philosophers that I, I, really, you know, I, I really, really enjoy is, uh, is somebody called Nagajura. And he said something that I think was very, very profound. Essentially, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said something along the lines of Nibbana and Samsara are in the same place. So the world with all its vicissitude, it's in the same place that freedom is, that enlightenment is. So these two things coexist together. They're in the same place. They have to exist there. So if one's there right now, the other one also has to be there. So it's really up to us what, we, what we do about that. It's really up to us how we engage with this. It's really up to us 
what kind of things that we do within this existence to either make it better or to make it worse? Are we moving more towards being more and more enmeshed in, in the vicissitudes of samsara? Or are we moving closer and closer towards these kinds of uplifting and enlightened kind of states of mind? And so, just to conclude, you know, I think you have this great opportunity to do this here. There's something very, very worthwhile. There's something very worthwhile with the Clear Mountain community uh, doing something that's very, very good in, in my eyes, thinking that uh, uh, bringing the kind of Dhamma into the world. I really, uh, really appreciate Tanisabo, what he's actually doing. Bringing the Dhamma to so many people and, and bringing it, having it come into people's hearts where they can actually share it. And so this is a very worthwhile thing I think you're doing. This is improving the world in some kind of, in some kind of way. You know, really, all this is, again, I, I started, the first talk I gave here, I started off by saying, you know, what Buddhism becomes is in your hands. But also now, what the Dhamma becomes is in your hands as well. You know, what Nibbana becomes is in your hand, and what Samsara becomes is in your hands now. So you have the opportunity here to either, to either make this existence and make these things around you more in line with Nibbana, or you can make it more in line with samsara. And so even if we are in samsara, and whatever that actually means, you know, we can try to make samsara a little bit better place. We can try to appreciate some of the good things that are in samsara and work on them and share those good things with others and really really move that goodness out into the world and just improve the world in some little kind of way. And that's what I think that you're doing here. So I'm very appreciative of you being here. And so with that, I'm again, I'm really, I've really been happy to be here. I'm very, very grateful for everybody that has put me up and has talked to me and taken me around and fed me and all the, you know, kept me, kept me warm, kept my extenuous parts warm kind of thing that's been really that's been really nice and people that have taken me around and showed me a lot about Seattle I really do feel like there's um, there's there's a really great place and there's there's I think there's a lot of good that can be done here and I think that you're all really doing a lot of good in the community here so with that I will sort of end the formal talk now Awesome. Very good. Yeah, it's really great. So, last week I I said to you, there's, there's you know a, a few weeks ago. Sorry, a few weeks ago, it's like oh, we can sort of break out into rooms and you can sort of chat about it and uh, chat about the uh, the the Dhamma talk or whatever or you know, break out into rooms. And last week I said, well, I want to actually ask you questions. So actually this week, I want to sort of do a combination of that. And one thing that anybody that knows me uh, actually starts to know about my personality is like, I really like being wrong. I, I, I actually really like people sort of like challenging me on things. I think, it's, I think it's great. I think it's really fun. So what I'd like to get you to do do today, if that's okay, and if you're comfortable with doing it, is sort of break out into into threes or something like that, and have a discussion, and also to to in a way to uh, in a way to sort of go well, what was wrong with my talk? What was wrong? What was wrong about it? Like, because I, I already know that there's some things that are wrong about. It. I'll give you a hint. I'm also making an assumption about what's good and bad. That's a that's one assumption there already. That I'm that I'm just made. So I, I can I can I can say a hundred things that I said wrong there. So what I'd like to get you to do is just sort of break out into into three of you yourself, and then we'll sort of think of well, what was what was sort of wrong. You can also tell me what was right about it as well. You know, I do have an ego that needs to be stroked every now and again as well. So that's that's also good. So yeah, we'll take take a few minutes and we sort of break off and and have a little bit of a chat about uh, what were some of the things that were. Uh, 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 potentially wrong or potentially right about it.
Okay, who who who'd like who'd like to get this started? I, I'm yeah. I'm, I'm also I'm also going to just for just for everyone. I, I have to repeat the question today because the microphone isn't working. So I'll repeat it for Zoom. Anybody on Zoom as well? You want to throw your hands up and and, and chime in? You're more than welcome to. I can't see you, so if somebody could let me let me know if there's somebody on Zoom that uh, uh, wants to chime in. But yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. 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 Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, I, I could. I could. You, you think I can give a dumber talk? I can speak like pretty intensely on grunge. So. <laughs> yep. Nice. Yeah. Nice. 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 Thanks. Thanks for that. So yeah, just just sort of reiterating that. You know, maybe, maybe becoming a little bit more clear on what we actually mean by something like samsara would be, would be better. And yeah, it's it's a difficult it's a difficult one without using a lot of the terminology because uh, it, it is a particular kind of religious. It is a religious idea, you could say. Uh, it is a particular kind of religious belief. So a lot of the terminology you sort of need to do it. But yeah, you did. 100%. I, I, I definitely think uh, yeah, explaining samsara would be a good thing, and um, yeah, and that you know that that I'm a little bit self-effacing, so that's a that's a that's a that's a good thing. So yeah, but has anyone got any ideas about about the ideas about the ideas of maybe something that was missing or lacking or yeah? Is there a right and wrong? Yeah. So that so the question is there is there is there a right and wrong? And s yeah, that's you know, as I said, that's an assumption that we're, that you're making in something like this, of that. Okay, I've said. Okay, I you know, uh, you know, I uh, I went to I went to these different places and and, and uh, all these people have treated me good in this kind of way. But is that is that actually good? Is that a good thing? There could be something negative in that. Um, I can't really think of anything off the top of my head at the moment, but there could be something negative in that. And we can also look at things in the world that maybe seem bad on the outset, but actually they have good consequences in the end. So, you know, that's an assumption there already, like what is good and bad? You know, is there a right and wrong? Now, the only thing I'd sort of push back on that is, is I think there's, I do think that there is also something where we're moving towards you could say, in a, in a sort of an easy way, we're moving towards more kind of happiness and flourishing. And I think, you know, I think most people would say that that's a net good. But if it's something that's moving towards you know, greater harm, greater, greater hurt for the world, I think that, you know, that would say that's something that's sort of bad, you could say, or wrong. So I think we sort of like look at least at those kinds of loose assumptions and, we can so, and then we can sort of say, well, if it's sort of moving in one of these other directions, then that is good, or that is or that is right, or that is wrong, kind of thing. So, but yeah, it's hard to draw an exact an exact line in the sand. There's a lot of ambiguity in there. So, yeah, it's you know you can, and this is actually this actually brings up an interesting point. You can uh, you can do a good action, like you can donate. Say for example, you donate money to some kind of good cause, but you know, what you believe to be a good cause really is up to you. You might think, you might think, and, and I'm, not I'm not supporting this, but I can say it, you might think that the KKK is a good idea, and you might give money towards it, and you think, I'm doing a good thing in the world by giving money to the KKK. You might think that that's the right thing to do, but that's not necessarily the right thing to actually do. So a lot of these things are... Uh, you know, we're, we're making an assumption of what is right and what is wrong. Um, and so just because we do an action doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's morally right. 
uh, you know, we, we do believe we have sort of social norms around what is right and wrong as well. So, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a big assumption. It's a big assumption. But I think if we sort of stick to those rules at least, or that, that kind of idea at least, that, that, you know, something is moving towards flourishing and something's moving towards harm, we could sort of say that these are maybe right or wrong. So. Anybody else? Did you have something? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 One thing that came up in the argument was uh, yeah. similarly the right to the permanent versus impermanent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yep, yep. Um, one could argue that that's a statement of fact that might be complicated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's kind of, that's kind of so, so, so why, why, why could it either be right or wrong? What, what do you mean I by that? That's kind of what I'm asking. Or it, it's more about the statement of fact, right? That right, that yeah. Something is something. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Permanent, yeah. Mm. Think about it from the perspective that was talked about in our group. Yeah. You know, the world will end at some point. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Suffering. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The suffering depends on human beings mm. Mm. Or, or sentient beings. Yeah. 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 yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's a and that's you know, that again, it's it's sort of another assumption and I guess if we're looking at it uh, I, and yeah, I probably should have clarified that a little bit better. It's like that's the Buddhist position. The Buddha's position is that, uh, the Buddha said that you know, samsara has no beginning and it will have no end, so it will perpetually go on. Um, but yeah, it is, that is an assumption as well, that samsara has no beginning and no end and that, and that it is something that's permanent. Um, and also that Nibbana is as well. So, so yeah, it's, there's, that's a, yeah, we are sort of making an assumption that, that, that they are either permanent or they're, they're not permanent as well, or they're impermanent. So it's a bit of an assumption there. Like if we look at, I think that's the interesting thing. If we look at most of our lives, it's pretty easy for us to see impermanence. But there is some sort of, you know, the, uh, you know the, there is some kind of consistency there. Consistency there. At some point, it will end at some point. But if we look at the continuity of human existence or whatever like it seems oh it seems and we look at you know the look at the nature of of how the universe has evolved over time that's it sort of seems reasonably permanent but yeah at some point it's going to collapse again <laughs> so, so yeah it's a it's a yeah no it's it's ah, it's, it's 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 ages away don't worry about it it's, it's fine <laughs> yeah steve Mm. And the word permanence mm. has all these connotations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perpetuation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because the way I kind of where I'm at now, whatever, is in terms of, I mean, I, I look at terms, at things in terms of emptiness and awareness. Mm. Or I used to. And, yeah. And, you know, with emptiness, the more it becomes clear that everything is, is arising and passing in interdependence constantly. There's yep. no concretization there. And then the mystery of it is in the middle of all that, there's yeah. this radiant awareness. Yeah. So they, they're kind of co-emergent from each other. Yeah. And, and um, so none of that is permanent in the sense of concretizing. And maybe it's endless. I get that. Right, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So maybe that's a different way to say it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'm sorry, I'll just repeat the repeat the, the question and the statement. Um, that that yeah yeah uh, uh, building on building on that, it's yeah there is a bit of a problem in in uh, thinking of things as permanent in that kind of a way, um, and so endless is maybe like a good way to think of these things because uh, because uh, you know if you sort of look in your practice in some kind of way, there's there's this uh, uh, tension there in some kind of way between something like emptiness and something like awareness. And within, within that space between those things, there is a kind of endlessness. Is that summarization? Yeah, yeah. Is there anybody on Zoom as well, by the way? I'll try to forget, yeah. Try not to forget. Holly, hey, Holly. I can't see you. You're behind a chair. Um, Ajahn, I thought you had... Uh, commented that samsara was permanent. Perhaps I uh, didn't listen well. And I was re reflecting that uh, 
I thought if you won was to attain nibbana, then you would be outside at the wheel of samsara, so it would be impermanent. No comments, please. Thank you. Yeah, really, really good point. And and I I just have to say it's like I you know I don't really know. That's that is that is the the idea that samsara is endless, it's permanent. But then also nibbana is uh, if one realizes nibbana, it's endless and it's and it's uh, and it's and it's permanent in some kind of way. And the that I guess that is the idea. It's like if you're you're either in one or the other. Um, so. You know, if you can get out of samsara, you you know, you by default, uh, you you reach nibbana kind of thing. So I think I think they, uh, from that Buddhist conceptualization, they are permanent in that kind of way. But I guess uh, uh, just to maybe clarify what I was sort of saying is uh, that, that that they coexist together. It's not like, you know, I wouldn't say that they're you know, they're the same kind of thing, but they are just a, you know, an endless kind of uh, uh, modality of existence or something that is that is there, but that they have to sort of be in the same place. Like if they're both endless, if they're both permanently abiding, uh, if, if nibbana is something that's already there, if the dhamma is something that uh, is is ageless, is timeless, um, um, uh, it, for for anybody to actually see, it has to be there already. And if we look at our lives now and we, and we think of this conceptualization of what samsara is, of this sort of vicissitudes of life, that's there already now as well. But that Nibbana also has to be there somehow as well. So it really depends on, on how we like weight our practice, which one we're sort of falling closer towards or moving closer towards. So does, Holly, does that answer the question? Did I make that a bit clearer or did I make that even more confusing? No, I think that's really interesting uh, logic on your part. Yeah. And I think what I'm hearing is that it's almost like two separate time streams. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I'm not, I'm not okay. sure if, yeah. yeah. Samsara running all the time and Nirvana, Nir, Nirvana running all the time. And yeah. at some point we can move from one to the other. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just. Anyway, to, thank you. Yeah, no. And thank you for being here. No, no problem. No problem. And, and just to clarify, I'm not sort of saying that either is like a, 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 a physical location in space kind of thing. It's not like you, you know, put Google Maps on and travel up the road and, you know, you get to Nibbana somewhere. And, but if you, if you take a right in one place, you get to Nibbana, but you take a left in another place, you get to Samsara. I'm not say, saying it's a, like a physical state of being. Um, but yeah, some, some sort of, uh, you could say like some sort of, modality of existence that I can't really I explain in good terms, but yeah, yeah, uh, hopefully, yeah, that's good. Um, any, anybody else on Zoom have anything or? Yeah. What's the first one? Lighthawk. I like so, um, hi. So, as I'm processing, I think that um, I'm kind of thinking of it as if I'm, I don't know if I'm correct or not, but like a duality. Would that be a, a good way to kind of term it? It's, the, a, it's a bit hard to hear you. Like, it's the, the sound isn't coming through so good, but were you asking, were you asking is, uh, are we looking at something like samsara and nibbana as a kind of duality? Is that, w was that your question? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, I, I, I guess, I, you know, I guess we can look at it. I guess we can look at it that way. Um, uh, and that's you know, historically how it's, how it's been looked at to some extent. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a fine way to look at it, so yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, that I'm wrong. Please, please tell me how wrong I, I like it. I really do like it. I'm perverse in that way. <coughs> My, so, Michael, first, yeah. But anyway, we'll move on. You were saying that that uh, your understanding is that samsara is something that's constructed, but nibbana is something that is not constructed. Atul. 
Mm. Right, okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the clarification there is that the it's uh, that nibbana, nibbana and samsara may not be a duality, um, but but that uh, nibbana is something else entirely that's outside of samsara. And what was the what was the Pali term you used again? Sorry. Atula. It's not comparable. It's yeah. Yeah, it's not comparable. And one is conditioned and one is unconditioned. Um, yeah, that's a good, really, really good point.